Greetings to those of you here in the room, those watching online and those watching later as if this is uh, printed online. I'm glad to see people here that I've known for decades and others meeting for the first time. Uh, uh, we're going to focus on how to develop a Marxist approach to strategy. A Marxist approach to strategy does not confuse ultimate goals with immediate tasks or vice versa, confuse what we want or wish with an understanding of the current actual lived reality with what actually confronts us in the situations, and it doesn't try and shoehorn reality into some kind of predetermined categories. Because in fact, reality is always more complex than our theories about it or our strategy about it. We have to adjust and deal with that reality as it changes. Strategy development isn't just about goals. For example, there are some in the environmental movement who correctly understand that capitalism itself is the main cause of environmental problems and the main obstacle to solving them. That to create fundamental solutions, we need socialism. They also correctly understand that um, in order to reach that socialism, a revolution is required, a fundamental transformation. But then they stop. They think that by identifying correctly these ultimate goals, they have identified a strategy. And this is just, this is uh, in a sense putting the cart before the horse. We end up with slogans such as revolution nothing less, or system change not climate change, or claims that all reform measures are simply a waste of time and we shouldn't do it anything other than work for revolution. Ultimate goals are not a strategy that takes into account where we are actually starting from, from current lived reality. And that doesn't take into account the need to win millions to that struggle. It's to be a revolutionary is not just about being militant and vocal, it's also about having a coherent strategy that will win people. That involves identifying ultimate goals, which is essential, it's just not the end point. We have to develop a correct estimate of the political and economic balance of forces, which is the foundation of any realistic strategy. We have to have an accurate view of what people's struggles, movements, and organizations, where they are at, what their potential is, what is required for unity. For example, for decades we've needed a third people's party. But needing it is not the same as having the forces necessary to create a successful, sustainable, powerful third party based on the working class, which can contend for power and which can sustain itself through multiple election cycles. We can, you know, want it or need it all we want, but we have to have the actual forces necessary to create it. There's no shortcut around the need to win a majority of the working class and to build broad alliances with the working class and allies, broad alliances, coalitions, and movements. Otherwise, uh, we're just talking to ourselves. We have to learn how to adjust and fine-tune our strategy as the balance of forces change, as the situation in which we find ourselves change. Strategy needs to identify the main enemy and obstacles, both immediate and long-term, identify the main forces for change, map out a general path from the current moment to our ultimate goals, so we're rooting ourselves in reality while having the end goal in mind. That gives us a framework within which to place our struggles, a way to make sense of the sweep of history that we're a part of. We have to clarify the next stage of struggle and how we can become agents of conscious transformative change to bring about that next stage of struggle. What kind of unity? What kind of struggle? What kind of alliances? What will it actually take to get us out of the situation that we're in at the, at the present moment, facing new challenges and new difficulties? Um, if you'd asked me months ago, uh, I would have said it would take might take two, three, four years to impeach Trump, and that would be a positive outcome, but it would take a long time because we have to win enough Republicans and pressure them enough to break them away from the Trump coalition. But with the movement rapidly developing and the resistance growing, I'm much more optimistic, and it might take eight months or a year, but uh, I'm much more optimistic and about our ability 
to reach that next stage of struggle and a much higher level of struggle actually. In developing strategy, we need to think dialectically to see all struggles and issues as processes in motion with their own internal contradictions which drive change. We need to reject the pressure to regard segments of the population or particular organizations as static and unchanging. Have to examine the history of how we got here with an eye not just to memorizing dates and times and facts, but understanding how change happens and understand that all processes are linked. While we have to focus on U.S. realities, those realities are not disconnected from what is happening around the world. What is happening in the U.S. with the Trump phenomena and movement, if you can call it that, is not unconnected from the right-wing movements that are rising in Europe. So what does thinking dialectically mean in the context of strategy? We need to look for the contradictions which drive change. For example, Trump is courting construction union leaders, but that's in contradiction with his appointments to the Labor Department uh, and with his support for national right to work legislation and his generally pro-business outlook. And that conflict, that contradiction will either drive those leaders to change or will drive the membership of those unions to force change in their union. It will cause conflict and change and uh, um, structure, you know, structural crises that will force change to happen. Thinking di dialectically means looking for tipping points between quantitative and qualitative change. For example, getting 50% plus one of votes which are cast in U.S. winner-take-all elections. And we shouldn't, this is not just a numbers question, this is a question of uh, slowly accumulating the quantitative changes that will result in a quantitative shift, a qualitative shift, sorry. For example, we have to understand what is actually shifting. In this last election, there was lots of uh, speculation about changes in the white working class, changes in um, uh, voting patterns, and different ways to slice and dice the electorate. Um, but what really changed there was no decisive shift, in my opinion, in the broad mass of the U.S. voting public, but there was a decisive shift as a result of the election with the Republicans winning the House, Senate, and presidency. They now have a significantly uh, more powerful way to set the initiative, to take the initiative and set the agenda. Thinking dialectically means looking for connections to broader processes. I already talked about this, the rising ultra-right neo-fascist movements in Europe are not fundamentally different from the Trump phenomena in our country. So there's something broader than just Trump's personality or the Tea Party that is driving changes in major industrialized countries. And we have to look for those links, understand that broader process, and look for the history of how a challenge developed. For example, the role of mainstream Republicans who encouraged and empowered the Tea Party long before Trump's candidacy. And that's an element of why his candidacy happened and why it's, he won the nomination and went on to win the election. Even Trump, uh, even mainstream Republicans who don't like Trump helped set the stage for him. So that's part of the history of how we got to here. But strategy is not an abstract thing. It doesn't test itself. The test of a strategy is whether it can operate as a successful guide to action. Good strategy means the unity of theory and practice. Test theory by applying it, measuring the results, and then adjusting the strategy to match what our experiences in the real world are. We can already learn lessons from the current struggles that are exploding around us. For example, the Women's March demonstrated that women's issues cut across many ideological, political, cultural, and even class lines and also that many working class issues are also women's issues and vice versa. There's no uh, wall in between them. Um, the Women's March demonstrated that working for unity is an essential part of the fight for full democracy, for the full participation of all in running society. Without a struggle against sexism and misogyny, the unity we need can't be built. And it also demonstrated 
that there was a mass hunger for resistance, a spontaneous outpouring beyond what <laughs> oh shit, really happening. Well, there, there's, there really is going to be a little, real struggle here. <clears throat> the airport demonstrations following Trump's exclusion order demonstrated that militant and quick responding resistance doesn't require smashing windows or starting trash fires, yet it can have a giant impact and work in concert with legal struggles, electoral struggles, petition and pressure campaigns, and civil disobedience. There isn't, again, a wall between these or some kind of magic uh, priority of what's, what's the best way to fight. You know, what's the best way that I should get involved? Well, the best way is to get involved, and there are a million ways to do it. The struggle itself, I mean, the struggle will teach us. It's not something that we, that comes from our head. It comes from the experience of millions of people in action. It showed, those demonstrations showed that many people understand that fighting for immigrants and right is the same fighting for rights for all, and that many of us will come out to, to fight all these various kinds of oppression, including people who are not directly affected. That's broad unity on these things. And they want to present us with a facade. They're we just have to get scared. And the, these demonstrations showed us we can, there are many ways to resist and fight. There are Republicans in many states are trying to make protests illegal or for, force protests pay for police charges of obstructing commerce or make it legal to run over protesters. They're trying to take away the space for organizing protest and opposition and resistance. So the ultra-right has for long been trying to demonize protesters, liberal, socialist, communist, and tries to paint all opposition as unpatriotic. And the volume of that stuff is just cranking up. Every time they face opposition, they have to find a way to crank up the volume of the things that they hope will divide us. We also face the challenge that some who oppose Trump focus on abstract issues like is it moral to punch a Nazi in the face or Congress ought to be ready to impeach right now uh, while ignoring the needs of the movement to reach and win tens of millions to make, those, make that happen, to make impeachment happen. not going to happen just because it needs to. It needs to. It's not going to happen just because it should ha happen. should have happened three weeks ago. It happens because we organize millions of people to create the change. And we can also see already that anarchists act as parasites on the main body of demonstrators, detracting from the main methods of unity and the massive nonviolent popular resistance. They, they draw on the temptation, especially with many people who have no previous experience of struggle, to get quickly frustrated and to search for a way around the need to win tens of millions of people and how difficult and how much work that is. We face ultra-left challenges like Chris Hedge's call in Truthdig to make America ungovernable. I think this and similar calls are based on a moralistic, apocalyptic vision, unconnected to real struggle. They damn the protests with faint praise uh, and claim that they're basically ineffective. Little is said about the need for a massive movement and what it'll take to build that movement. And it, intentionally or not, it encourages gestures of anger that temporarily satisfy the moral imperative to resist, but that work against reaching, winning, and organizing tens of millions of people. The ultimate flaw in his approach and that of many others on the, sort of the, the ultra-left side is that it demonstrates no confidence that tens of millions of people can be reached or mobilized. So they look for another way out, a way around it, a shortcut, something that will get us away from the need to organize tens of millions. Um, so in my opinion, his analysis of the fascist, in this article, 
analysis of the fascist potential in the Trump administration is a bit apocalyptic, but it's not too far off from what I fear in my most fearsome moments about what they will attempt. But there is no successful strategy for stopping fascism that doesn't organize tens of millions. There's no successful strategy for getting rid of Trump that doesn't organize tens of millions. Ungovernability or throwing our bodies on the machines of the system uh, done by relatively small numbers only provides an excuse for their for repression. It doesn't actually create the force necessary to make change happen. Now Hedges in that article does call out anarchists for their reliance on counterproductive violence and he quotes someone else who says, while a general strike would be a real blow against Trump, the call for a general strike might be a bit premature. I don't want to oversimplify his approach. There's an article in Jacobin that came out at a, about the same time that notes that just calling for a general strike doesn't make an effective or massive one happen. Of course, yesterday uh, I read another Jacobin article that called for the left to work to make a general strike possible. That ought to be our main focus. Um, and it purposely mixed up examples of various successful mass demonstrations with real general strikes. Nothing wrong with massive demonstrations that are not general strikes. We don't have to pretend that there's something they're not. They're valuable on their own and even with their limitations. But to create a successful general strike, it, it's, again, it's not just about having a good idea and shouting it really loud. It's about organizing millions of people. All proposals that avoid the need to organize and mobilize tens of millions in the long run are counterproductive. Strategy can help us figure out the right questions. So I don't think the right question is, is it moral to punch a fascist in the face? <laughs> the right question is, if our main task is to build the broadest movement possible, the only force capable of defeating moves towards fascism, does punching an individual fascist in the face help build that movement? It's not it's some abstract, it, is it moral or not, are Nazis evil people and should, do they deserve to get punched? It's, We're not put in my headphones. Because we can punch as many individual fascists as we want, but that doesn't change the fact that it takes a massive movement organization, protracted and consistent struggle to um, create fundamental change. Other challenges are that there are calls to make the center the main target of attack or to make democratic leadership the main enemy. Unfortunately, this duplicates the mistake in surprisingly closely made by the German Communist Party in the early 1930s. Before Hitler's ascension to full power, Thälmann, who was the head of the German party, uh, I'm not, maybe not pronouncing it correctly, uh, was quoted as saying, after Hitler, us. Mm -hmm. Communists saw social democrats as the main obstacle to workers coming to revolution, and therefore saw attacking social democrats as their main task. Get yourself into now, the, the German party did attack the the It did engage in lots of street battles. There were pitched battles in all the major German cities. But that it's didn't... The same okay. Okay. Um, but they engaged in street battles. They punched lots of fascists. They had the socialists, the communists, and the Nazis all had ex-service member organizations, and they engaged in pitched street battles. But that didn't make the fascist danger go away. The German party did attack fascism, but it didn't make its main task to unite all left and center forces against the fascist danger. Many experiences which led to Dimitrov's United Front speech, which I hope you read in preparation for this weekend, which criticized the German Party's union enough of a fight against fascist ideology and for underestimating the fascist danger. I was very struck by a quote uh, as when I reread uh, that United Front speech where he says, you know, we, under, we didn't fight fascist ideology enough. 
we thought something so stupid and idiotic couldn't get mass, mass support. And it was like, nah, nah, you know, <laughs> echo, there's an echo in the room. Uh, so there are plenty of justified criticisms of the center and of Democratic Party leadership, and we should, I don't think we should try and mute such criticism, but we do have to insist it not be the main focus of the left. That's not, there are people who are saying, if we don't attack the Democratic Party leadership, we'll never win anything. And that's, they have it exactly backwards. If we organize tens of millions of people, the Democratic Party leadership will change. And we have to insist that, that those criticisms not detract from the main need of the present moment, building a sustained, organized, multi-issue, multifaceted mass resistance movement. It's important to get our estimation of the balance of forces right. The German party in the early 1930s underestimated the danger of fascism. The communist movement learned a correct lesson to be wary of the preliminary steps towards fascism and to fight the preliminary steps and not wait till it gets here. However, overestimation of or overreacting to fascist danger leads to prematurely abandoning room for struggle for political protest and organized resistance. And our own party made a version of that mistake, overreacting to the fascist danger, in the late 1940s, early 1950s. I don't want to oversimplify this, and I can't, you know, we don't have the time to go into it in depth. So I don't want to make it seem like there was a simple or straightforward mistake where that people didn't know what they were doing. Um, there were real steps towards fascism. The McCarran Act authorized setting up political concentration camps, and I list a few other, many other things that were happening. And the party didn't just overreact to the fascist danger. We waged many massive public and democratic struggles against the Smith Act cases to get millions of people to sign the Stockholm Peace Appeal, fight to save the Rosenbergs, electoral campaigns for the Progressive Party, the We Charge Genocide Petition, and many others. Still, the party made decisions that made itself smaller and isolated from key allies. For example, in the National League Grow Labor Council, the party worked to disband it against the wishes of other key leaders, including Coleman Young. For example, the party made a decision that there were a lot of people who had joined and they weren't all reliable, so we were going to cut the size of the party administratively. For example, we sent way too many of our leadership underground, more than we had the organizational capacity to support. So that's why we have to get these questions right. This is why strategy is important. If you don't have it right, you end up doing something that ends up being counterproductive in one way or another. Strategy is a way to convince others to join us because we have a plan that resonates thinking and application of the unit is part of the struggle against ideological attacks and diversions. And it's a guide, not a blueprint. We're not trying to match estimating the balance of force, under or overestimating the danger of fascism. Avoid either over reliance on constitutional norms, on the one hand, or on the other, not taking full advantage of battles to protect those political norms. It's not that we have faith that just because the U.S. has a constitutional government with a long history, that it's impossible for the fascists to have a military coup. That's what the many Chileans thought. And they had good reason to, to do that. So we can't just rely on the fact that there's a constitution and a long history by itself. But the fight to keep those political norms is part of our battle to protect democracy. So strategic errors lead to problems with tactics in ways that matter to millions of workers and poor people and our allies. If we uh, focus on one, uh, on talking about, for example, how Trump ought to be impeached, and we don't focus enough on saving the food stamp program, that will affect millions of people. If we don't fight these deportations now, he's going to call out the National Guard and try and deport millions of people. 
So we, these, these struggles matter to people's lives. So strategy helps keep us focused on the mass resistance, so on the need for unity. I'm almost done. Without proposing a specific strategy, here are some points of necessity that have to be included. The history of the U.S. can be seen in part as a continual set of struggles to expand and protect democracy alongside efforts to thwart such progress. Racism has been central to the construction of capitalism in the U.S., a central element of creating and maintaining division within the working class and progressive movements, and unity in the struggle against racism has been a powerful tool for change for all movements. Sexism is a crucial support for the system, a source like racism of super profits, a tool to divide movements and an obstacle to full unity. And while the working class is central to creating fundamental economic and political change, the working class alone can't do it. We need to unite with broad sections of the people's movements. We need to win a decisive majority of the people because nothing less will win. There isn't a shortcut, is what I'm saying. And we have to deal with the reality that we don't have to like it. We don't have to think it can't change eventually. But the two-party system and winner-take-all elections are the central realities of how our political system functions. And we can't change that in the short term or wish it away. It's, I wish it wasn't the case. There are many alternatives. We can engage in battles that help expand the range of democratic possibilities. But that's not a quick fix. And we can't substitute that for the immediate fights that we're faced with. I want to give you another strategic framework example, because uh, right after the election and continuing up to now, there are lots of proposals about how different slices of the electorate voted and how they shifted. But that could draw our attention away from a larger framework issue. One of the basic problems, not the only one, is that the US electorate has been relatively closely divided for over three decades. All of the ideas about what threw the election to Trump can all be true. But if the US electoral system more closely resembled the actual sentiments of the majority of the people of our country, the messing around at the edges wouldn't matter. It's only because they've managed to restrict it that gaming the system by gerrymandering and voter suppression and infusions of money uh, to ultra-right candidates, those only work because they've managed to over decades to contain the electoral system uh, to produce results that do not match where the sentiments of our people actually are. So that has to, changing that calculation, it's not just about analyzing this group voted this way or this group voted that way or this percentage turned out, it's about expanding the pie, expanding the forces that are brought into electoral struggles and other struggles. So it's my contention, I'm not uh, trying to define all our strategy or anything, but it's my contention that when we organize all our efforts for unity around the struggle to protect and extend democracy, we connect our struggles with powerful and deep-rooted struggles from our country's history, fights for civil rights, for the vote for women, to end the poll tax and literacy tests, various struggles against laws that tried to outlaw protest and the rights to freedom of assembly and free speech. We turn the myth about how perfectly democratic the US is, which has never been true, into a weapon, a way to help people understand that to make the myths of democracy true, we have to fight to make it true. And by focusing on democracy and sort of using that as the organizing principle for our strategy, we protect the right of all movements and people to protest, to organize, to demonstrate, to engage in politics. And that helps prevent the marginalization of progressive and radical politics, of movements, and connects them to the fights for the real needs of people. So I would urge us to think about, as we're going through the many presentations and discussions we'll have this weekend that talk about this uh, amazing array of struggles that are happening all around us, that we think about what is the unique and essential contributions our party can make. How can we participate most effectively while continuing to build our own organization? 
What divisions are there in the ruling class and how can we take advantage of them? What is necessary to create a transformative unity to reach a higher level of breadth and of militancy for the movement as a whole? And how can we connect struggles to our ultimate goal, socialism? Thank you. Thank you.